I hope everybody can understand my English. It's not perfect, but I'll do my best. Um, yep, so that's the first, uh, the first comment. It's going to be in English. I hope everybody is okay. Uh, second one is I want to make very clear what this is about because I, I as, a, as an attendee in conferences, I, I hate it when I uh, go out to, to a talk and I discover way too late that it's way too basic for me or way too advanced or I was, I was expecting something different. So we are going to talk about Node.js, NPM and uh, non-trivial projects in Node.js. Uh, so if you have a lot of experience, if you have uh, uh, been uh, architecting or even participating in a complex project in Node.js or if you have been working for, uh, with Node.js for many years, this is probably not for you, so no hard feelings, please find something better, uh, you, you can make uh, b better use of your time. Also, you, if you have never seen Node.js, perhaps it's not going to be that useful for you. So I hope that is clear and everybody can get something out of it. Um, if you are very advanced and you still stay here, um, my hope is that you can contribute as well, so I'm willing to hear from you at the end. Uh, so you can share your um, comments, questions, uh, corrections about what I'm going to say. And the third comment is that this presentation is as you see it uh, on, online on my GitHub. Uh, the link is on, uh, on the agenda. So just click on the, I think it says uh, slides. And you can see it uh, on real time. If you want to go forward or backwards, you can follow me that way. This is what we are going to talk about. <clears throat> the important stuff is in bold. So uh, briefly, uh, I will say who I am, who am I. Um, then we'll talk about the challenges in complex Node.js projects, um, how we could organize that project, um, and how to make automatic builds. That's pretty much the core of it. And then we'll talk about a few other things that are usually necessary, um, like updates, responding to vulnerabilities, linting, hinting, continuous integration, many other things. Uh, you will see that in those parts, I will probably mention some NPM packages you already know and use. So this might be less important. We can go faster in that part. And I want to make sure that I have, we have enough time at the end for questions and comments. I, I pretty much want this to, this to be a debate more than question and, and answer, because as I said, I'm sure there will be other people who, with a lot of experience and you can probably uh, if you see something I'm doing which is not optimal, you can please raise your hand at the end and uh, uh, make your suggestions and of course questions as well. So I'll try to make sure we have at least five minutes for that uh, at the end. Uh, right. Um, so again, this is not rocket science, so I hope you can extract something of value here. So this is who I am. Uh, my name is Antonio Olmo. Uh, but I'm Tripu everywhere on the internet. Uh, when I submitted my talk, I didn't realize I was locked in in Coliseo as Tripu, so that's what it says everywhere, but Tripu or Antonio is the same. Everybody calls me Tripu anyway. Uh, I'm a software engineer, been working for a few years in different companies, different countries. Um, currently, I'm at the World Wide Web Consortium, the W3C. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the organization. For those who don't, is the international uh, non-profit uh, that publishes uh, many standards and specs related to the web. So hundreds of standards, literally, everything going from HTML, old versions, CSS, SVG, uh, many of the new APIs on the browser. So it's uh, published by W3C. I've been there for four years working in the systems team and doing development there. I've been working with uh, JavaScript for many years. I, I don't remember when I started and uh, using Node.js for the past four and a half years, I'd probably. And as I said, I'm Tripu. You can find my, uh, if you look for Tripu on the GitHub, CodePen, NPM, everywhere. That's the handle I use. And that's my website as well. Okay. So what is the challenge? If we were talking about the uh, typical Hello World application, this is not important, but let's assume you have a project that is not trivial and has many requ requirements. It's a modern project, um, uh, probably being developed by more than one person, uh, ambitious with many parts. I call them pieces here. Imagine, imagine uh, what I'm going to talk, uh, I want it to be very generic, but you can picture your own project in your head. Perhaps you have your own project in your head right now. Uh, it might be that you are doing, uh, you are exposing an API, you are offering a web interface that has to be responsive and then blah, blah, blah. Uh, perhaps you are accessing database or databases. Um, 
you might need to do uh, background processing. Uh, imagine that your users are uploading images and every night you have to process those images to do some transformations on them. You could be handling mail, uh, web sockets, so complex applications, okay? You, you could think of this thing as more than one application, but we, we will call it the project. A large code base. Ideally, in the Node.js world, uh, we would want to do these things here. Uh, we would want to publish those pieces independently, if it makes sense, right? Uh, you could uh, develop something very fancy that you want to share and make it open source. So ideally, you want to be able to publish it on NPM. Uh, ideally, you want to be able to deploy those pieces as microservices when it makes sense, and if it makes sense. Uh, and when it's in production, you want to manage those processes independently. You don't want to just start the whole thing or stop it. Ideally, you should be able to balance and uh, manage those processes independently. In any complex project, it's very likely that you will have some shared libraries. Think of those, uh, of those as utilities. Uh, the typical example is access to the database. You don't want to be writing SQL in every single piece. You want to encapsulate that in one module. Related to shared libraries, there is another thing called aspect. Some of you may have heard about that uh, from software engineering. It's not very much used or discussed nowadays, but it was quite popular uh, 15 or 20 15 years ago or so. Um, aspects are or concerns of your software that typically span the whole project horizontally. So. Uh, uh, the typical example is logging. You may de develop your application and then you realize you want to keep track of what's happening. Uh, users locked in, error handling, um, processes that are taking too long, events in your system. If you come to that and think of that as an afterth afterthought, it's going to be too late. So this is what we call an aspect. It should be horizontal and affect your entire project. Same about other things like uh, security in general and author authorization. And um, it's very likely that you will have some shared uh, configuration. So you might have a username and passwords for the database, uh, some fine tuning in the servers. Uh, so a lot of configuration. You don't want to duplicate that in all the, those different pieces, right? If these were everything, uh, life would be easy. But we know that nowadays, if you want to be, uh, to be a good engineer, you have to do also all that. So I'm sure many of you, again, do these things. This is the good practices. We should do that. We know it's important. Some of them are more important than others, but I'm sure that uh, you are familiar with them, right? And as I said, you, you might be familiar already with many NPM packages that make your lives easier uh, about these things, right? These are a few. I'm sure you have other important uh, practices in mind. But uh, I hope you will agree that this is like a common uh, baseline, right? If we want to do things the proper way, right? All right, so many requirements is not trivial, right? What I want to present is a, a specific proposal, which is not optimal, is not the way you should always do it. It's just uh, the result of some uh, experience, both in personal projects, pet projects of mine, at work, with colleagues, open source on GitHub, and so on. So how do we organize that code? Um, when we come to that, uh, we might have two temptations. The, the first one is to do something mon monolithic. So just create one repository. We will talk about Git, but this could be SVN or any other, as, as any other uh, control version system. Uh, so just one repository and one huge package.json. And I will organize my libraries in subdirectories. Um, I will, I will try to um, have a hierarchy of directories and classes uh, that will keep things sorted out. Well, you could do that, right? Another tempta temptation we could have is, okay, this is, those are pieces, so let's split them up in different pieces, right? So let's uh, uh, create different repositories, and each repository will be its own Node.js application with its own package.json, and that way life would be much easier, right? Well, you could probably see that there are advantages and disadvantages to both approaches, and I'm sure you can think of some of those. Let's mention a couple of those, very obvious. Uh, the monolithic project. Uh, it will be very difficult for you in the future to 
to when your application is growing or if you want to share code so with a third party or publish it as open source, it's going to be very difficult to split that up as you continue developing. It's not going to be trivial. Uh, also, it's going to be difficult for you to establish boundaries. You have different teams uh, working on different areas, but all of them share, share the same code base. So it's not going to be easy. Uh, an important uh, problem of the second approach is that if you have to do releases that include breaking changes, it's going to be non-trivial to coordinate all those teams in all those different projects to make sure you commit, tag, label, uh, merge at the same time, you uh, bump your version uh, accordingly, you, you use the right version of each piece and you deploy them all at the same time, that is going to be complicated. And those are just two of the problems we could see with that, right? So there has been some debate about that, about these challenges. Um, these approaches are sometimes called many repos and mono repos. And uh, if you, if you cl click on that link, you will get to a Medium article discussing the pros and cons of those things. Um, there is, a, I think, a tendency to go towards mono repos, uh, although it may seem uh, counterproductive or a bit weird, but uh, those have some advantages. And that is the approach we take here. Um, this is a loose definition of one repos. You can find others offline. Basically, it's just having one repository for the whole thing. As I said, if uh, we were mentioning this a decade ago, we would be called crazy because the, the tendency is to split things up and keep repositories small and all those things. But uh, if you do some research, you will see that uh, many big, well-established companies with uh, a ton of very talented engineers they opt for this, and it might be for some good reason, right? Uh, so you have some examples here from Google and Facebook and Twitter. So in, uh, in the Node.js world, uh, NPM in principle was not created to handle this kind of project. Uh, so th there are a couple of, uh, at least these two tools that I know of, um, Lerna for NPM and Workspaces for Yarn. Uh, we, we will not discuss, discuss those in this talk, but if you find yourself in this situation, make sure you check those out because those, those might be helpful for you. Okay, so this summarizes a little bit the structure I want to suggest and you, you might want to adopt. Uh, this is project full to make it as generic as possible. And again, I encourage you to think of your own problems at your company. Uh, I'm sure you could have uh, you could find a parallel and think of something similar, right? So some of these pieces are going to be probably there. You probably have some utilities. You probably have some authentication logic, uh, some database, at least one. Uh, other pieces, well, those may, may differ. Uh, you might have an API or not. You might have a, a user interface or perhaps not. So those could be different. So what do we have in this? This is the listing of a single directory. This is our Git repository, right? So the first five files are configuration files. I'm sure you are familiar with those. Um, we will discuss them a bit later in the talk. Let's keep them aside for now. Config.json is the configuration. So everything that has to be shared will be there. And it's just written once. And it's at the root of the repository. Build.sh uh, build is a bash. Uh, script is a shell script that we will use to uh, to perform well to build the whole project. We will see that later as well. And then there are these couple of handy directories: doc for documentation and logs for logs. Uh, and as we will see, it makes sense to keep them at the root di directory as well. And now, if if we examine each one of these foo dash whatever directory, we will find pretty much the same structure, okay? I have not repeated the same, the same thing, but uh, this that you see under food API, you would see the same under the other food dash, whatever. Um, and here you see that we have a package.json and the node modules. So that means that each one of these directories is going to behave as a separate uh, Node.js project. Um, we will mention this known, this is known vulnerabilities.txt, we will mention that later. 
uh, each um, again each piece will have its own version of that file and that makes sense uh, this is the main entry point for this particular package and we will have other libraries or whatever or SQL files whatever is necessary in each case okay So um, these pieces are related and there is a graph of dependencies. So as we said, some of them like logging or database access will be used by many of the other pieces while others will be pretty much independent and they will be only um, needing other pieces but not, not being used by any other, right? It's like a graph. Um, so let's take two, uh, two examples. Imagine again that you have a streaming server. This is one of your pieces. In the package.json for your streaming server, you might see something like this. Um, you have this dependency, um, and instead of uh, specifying the ID of an npm package or anything or a tag on GitHub, we just use the file uh, colon uh, syntax. Who, who was familiar with this? Who has ever used uh, a dependency like that? A few people. Okay, not not many, but some of you have. Yeah, um, it's not very popular, but I find myself using that. Uh, Quite common, uh, quite commonly, because, uh, for example, you you have a dependency, you download, you clone the whole project from GitHub, and you just need to do a fine change, a little change to make it work for your needs. You are not willing to clone and submit a pull request. This is just a silly experiment. What do I do? I just do file and then specify the relative path to my local clone of that uh, package, and that works. It's quite handy that way. Okay. So this uh, piece will be using the database uh, module. Uh, let's imagine the user interface, our web pages. Again, they will, be, they will probably need authorization, access to the database, some utilities. OK, you get, the, you get the idea, right? So it's very easy to specify those dependencies in that way. No need to publish to NPM and so on. Uh, your project might not be open source. Perhaps you will never. Intent, you never intend to uh, publish it, it's private, so this is a good way to do it. Um, okay, and then in your JavaScript code, in each of the modules, trivially you will just require the, uh, the specific uh, module you need, and as you, as you can see, this convention foo, dash, whatever, uh, we keep it everywhere, so to be consistent. And, and that's it. That's it. If ever you publish one of those packages and you want to import them from npm, this will not change. The only line you will have to change is the file colon. Instead of file colon, you will just put the name of the package and it will keep on working. So we mentioned this file build.sh on the left hand side. Uh, again, it's a simple script, uh, simple script for Bash. Uh, I'm sure you can write the equivalent for PowerShell or whatever you guys use. Um, we will see what it does very quickly. Um, uh, this chunk, I, I pasted the whole thing just for, for, for you guys to have it in case it's useful, but this is trivial. This is just printing the options, some help, and so on. Uh, basically, this uh, script you can invoke with three options, uh, help, and the other two are uh, clean and scratch. Clean. It just uh, uh, removes everything node, uh, all the node modules directories, uh, so as to keep everything uh, clean from dependencies. And Scratch installs everything, but before it removes the dependencies as well. And Clean also removes all the generated documentation. Um, yep. And this is how it works. Uh, very easy. You just invoke it. No. Um, you pass the wrong parameter, run, which is nothing, and it just tells you, please invoke it with help. Type dash help, and it will show you the options. Nothing, nothing complicated. Uh, this chunk, again, we are still seeing the build.sh file. This chunk is the core of it, and it's, again, very simple. It just uh, traverses all the directories, uh, beginning with this handy prefix that we have as a convention. And for each one of those, it does basically one thing. Uh, npm, ins sorry, two things. npm install and npm run build, which is our uh, convention for uh, building the respective package. So just that. Uh, yep. 
And as I said, if it's scratch or clean, uh, then it will also remove documentation and node modules just to make sure that everything is uh, fresh. And the last part um, is generation of the whole documentation. So you might, you might have documentation per package, but you may also want to have a aggregated documentation for the whole thing and dump in somewhere. Uh, this is not optimal. There, there are, you will see there are a few parts where I didn't spend time making things uh, scalable and pretty and generic enough. So uh, listing directories in this way is not the best way to do it, but I'm sure you can do a shell expand with some variable or do a find command or whatever. But it basically runs the JS doc package and generates the documentation. Uh, let's see that in action. Uh, this particular project I call SIP, but you can imagine it's project foo. Basically, it's the same thing. Actually, let me show the... Uh, well, as you can see, the directories we mentioned. And if you run, again, this is called check all, but it's build.sh, just a different name, same script. It will just do that. It will go one by one, npm install, and then npm run build. And maybe you don't remember, but the script has a break. So the first package and the first step that fails, it will stop the whole script. So we, can, we know that there is an, an error there for some reason, there is some issue. So we go back to that package, fix whatever er error we found, and we issue the command again. Well, that's it. That, it will do that for all packages. And at the very end, it will generate the, the documentation for all of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so that was the core of it. Now I want to share with you a few tricks, uh, useful one-liners uh, that could be, again, useful for you, maybe. Uh, updates. Um, different approaches for that. Uh, if, you, if, your plug, if your project is public on GitHub, you can use Greenkeeper, which is a handy um, uh, product. It will submit a pull request every time there is a new version of your package in any of your dependencies. Very, very easy and very handy. Uh, apart from that, you have npm check and updater without the E, U-P-D-T-R. Um, NPM check, make sure that all your dependencies are used. So it's very typical that you import lots of things. You require lots of things and your code changes and there are some zombie dependencies that are no longer required. NPM check will tell you. And as you can see in that example, NPM check dash I, then you can specify packages that uh, you are still using even if NPM is not able to, to detect them. And the other package, uh, I like it a lot, uh, I, I run it uh, compulsively uh, just to make sure that I'm with the latest version every time. Um, dash S exact, it's because I don't like the caret thing, I like to specify versions uh, with the whole version. So it just uh, gives you the latest without the caret. And uh, minus T uh, tells uh, updater with, uh, what is your test, what is your run uh, script. So if you have something custom, use dash t for that. And that example shows you how after running updater, it will find two versions new and it will um, automatically run the tests and if they succeed, they will change the version in your package.json and it will install them. So it's pretty handy. And finally, uh, again, I found that useful. Uh, some of those dependencies are shared among different packages and when one of them is increased and there is a new release available, I don't want to go into each single package.json and change them all. So this uh, one-liner with said uh, will replace mocha from this version to, this and to that other version in all package.json. So just a, a quick way of doing the same thing. Okay, I'll try to finish in 10 minutes, so we have enough time for... Anybody has questions uh, so far? Any corrections or suggestions about better ways to... Please. Yeah, I have a question about the previous build screen you showed. Um, why were you removing the package log file? Was I? 
in the build script, yeah, in the next one. In the build that, that you are removing the package log. Ah, yep. Is there any reason to do that? Uh, um, how do you say talk in English? Uh, obs obsessive, compulsive. Um, <laughs> OCD, thank you. Yeah, yeah, OCD. So no, no reason. Um, I, I think I tended to do that before uh, package, dot, package lock was common when they released it because I don't like to have that file being changed all the time. No good reason. Just a personal mania. Yeah. Same with node modules. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that NPM knows what it's doing, but I'm so used to just removing the whole thing out and have it install everything from scratch. I don't know. Perhaps I don't trust NPM enough. But yeah, good question. You don't need that. Yeah, uh, okay. Vulnerabilities. So I wanted to share again a tiny trick here. So who was here using NSP, the node security pl platform, to keep track of vulnerabilities in packages in NPM? Nobody? Nobody? <laughs> Okay, you should have. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we used then it's not going to be that interesting, but well, actually it's going to be interesting. You should be using something like that. So we used to do that before. We, we had NSP package. Uh, a few months ago, they merged. They were acquired by NPM, and now they are same company. And now we have NPM audit. Exactly, yeah, NPM audit. That's the one you should be using now, NPM audit. So back in the days when we used uh, NSP, there was one, one cool thing about it. And the, oh, okay, so you run NSP and it will tell you for all your dependencies, the whole tree, not just your direct dependencies, but the whole thing up to the last leaf in the tree, it will tell you if one of those packages has uh, issued a vulnerability. So you can then act and either replace it or patch it or whatever. But uh, it was very common. It was very common that NSP would uh, complain and say, hey, hey, hey there, is a, there is an issue here. There is a potential regex uh, issue or potential uh, DDoS uh, attack with this package, which is 20, 20 levels down your dependency tree. And very often you would say, OK, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, how we dealt with that was we had this uh, special file listing all the vulnerabilities that we know of. We are cool with those. Don't bother about, that, about those. Um, this has a couple of issues. One of them is you cannot uh, control which package is issuing. issuing um, so um, you don't know in which node of the tree of dependencies that package is being used because you could have it being used ma many times. Some of them could be safe uses. Other uses could be a bit suspicious. Um, and another problem was that if you had a file like that, you were cool, you were doing your builds, everything worked, and p perhaps a few months later you realized that some of those vulnerabilities had al already been patched and solved, and you were still keeping those around. No big deal, but you should know what risks you are taking, so that's not, that's not what we should do. That was yesterday. Now we use NPM audit, as you said, which is the right way of doing it, and the problem with it is NPM audit does not have a mechanism for exceptions. Uh, and that's annoying. That's very annoying because, again, if you have complex projects, project, it's very difficult that NPM audit will not complain at least of one dependency down the dependency tree. So what you can do is this. Very simple. Uh, remember we had a known vulnerabilities txt. I think I wrote known vulns before. Never mind. So this file. Uh, you just uh, put on, those file, uh, on that file all the vulnerabilities that you know are safe. And then um, you have a script in your package.json that will run, run npm audit and it will, uh, sorry, it will uh, do a grep search to find all lines containing uh, what we know is a, a URL for a vulnerability. Uh, so this is digits. And then we will diff, uh, find out the difference with this file here. So it's very simple, but uh, NPM audit will return a list of uh, vulnerabilities with a lot of verbose text. With that, we keep only the interesting lines and we compare with that. And the diff command will succeed only if they are exactly the same. So only if that file contains exactly what NPM audit returns after this grepping. So if this succeeds, uh, this uh, audit script will succeed and our builds can continue. So that's good. 
And not only that works, and is not already implemented by NPM audit itself, which it should, I think, but it, uh, it has a couple of advantages. One of them is, I have this two, uh, twice. Why twice? Because I know that it's happening in this package here and in that other package there. So I'm forgetting, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, worried about those two. But if tomorrow there is a third instance of the same vulnerability, I will know it, because this will fail. And the second advantage is that when those vulnerabilities are no longer there, uh, this will fail again. It will not stay silent, it will complain, because something has changed. So it's a better way to do that. Okay, uh, five, seven minutes, I will try to be quick, uh, so we can discuss a bit more. Uh, yeah, this is probably not so interesting to many of you. Uh, who here is using ESLint? Yeah, good, that's very popular. You might be using it for front-end uh, JavaScript as well. Good, and uh, well, I, I personally use ESLint with this plugin, ESLint uh, plugin node and JS Hint. I find that uh, those two tools combined uh, complement each other quite nicely and they, when one of them doesn't find a suspicious uh, pattern, the other one usually does, so it's a, they are good. Uh, again, uh, you could have it as one of your scripts and um, in the same way that we, the script we have to build everything before failed, as soon as something failed, uh, the, our master script to, buy, to build the whole package, um, I like to do it that, that way with ampersand ampersand, so the first script that fails will cause the whole thing to break and to stop, so we know that something is wrong and we can go and, and fix it. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know, uh, this is the typical uh, configuration for this tool, for ESLint and for JSHint. Uh, important thing, this is just uh, in one place, because remember, those files were living at the root of the directory, so every package is using the same configuration, so no duplication. Uh, if the team decides to, decides to fine-tune, to tweak those rules in some way, they do it here, it will affect the whole code base, so it's much cleaner. Um, those two tools, they allow you to specify exceptions in your code, so it can be per function or even per line. So typically I don't allow myself to use console log, but when you are developing, often you, you still want to do it, so just uh, make sure you add a comment after that line, so ESLint will not complain. Uh, just make sure that you delete it afterwards. Uh, code coverage. Uh, who is doing code coverage with JavaScript? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Not many people, okay. Even if your code coverage is just 10%, it's always a good, a good thing to, to have. Uh, it makes your automatic builds more robust. If you know that a decent percentage of your code is covered by tests. So I use uh, NYC and coveralls uh, in that way. Nothing special. Um, I run my tests using NYC, uh, integrate that as part of the build, so again the build script, which is the, the important one, and coveralls, uh, again coveralls is a public service, I'm not sure if they have a paid uh, private version, but uh, you will only use it if your code is uh, uh, open source, I think. Uh, this is an example of the output you will get when you use uh, these tools, so this is telling you those two files, how many branches are covered, how many lines. Um, and if you submit your results to coveralls, uh, you will see reports like that one. Or they are quite nice. They will show you whether you have kept up with your uh, suite of tests or not. Something to brag about or not. Just a word about continuous integration. This is not uh, specific about complex projects, but uh, if you were doing it with simple projects, with complex projects, and the more reason to, to do it with those uh, recommended Travis CI or Circle CI. Uh, if you are running at your companies or at your home server um, version of GitLab, GitLab is really good at, at keeping up to date with uh, GitHub in features. So they have something that facilitates continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, they call them pipelines and jobs and schedules and so on. 
and uh, a big uh, question mark about uh, GitHub Actions. They released uh, very recently, right? A few weeks ago. And it, it looks like they are going to be quite powerful and, and useful and uh, perhaps they will um, override uh, what Travis CI is doing now. But uh, you can opt in to the beta, I think. Uh, we did already at the W3C, but we are waiting to hear from them. I don't know when they will be released. Uh, okay, a couple of quick more things. If you have a web interface, you should validate uh, or check. Uh, so we used to call them validators and some of us uh, now prefer to call them checkers because that's one way of making it clear that those tools are not uh, uh, error proof. Uh, it doesn't warranty that your markup or CSS is going to be 100% valid. They, they, they are not that complete. But they are good, uh, they are good test and check. So. Instead of um, going to our validators online, w3.org, uh, which puts a lot of traffic on our servers, uh, I want to suggest a better alternative. It's also better for you. If you download that project, you clone that project, it's public on GitHub, that's the new validator. Uh, it's intended to replace the old versions and it behaves much better. It's much more adapted to HTML5. So clone it, it's a bit of a beast. It's Java and it will take a while to compile, so uh, make yourself a coffee. Uh, but once, once it's ready, you have it there forever, you can use it offline, no need to use uh, the validators online, you could be using it on the train, and it's very simple. So you could have a script like that, validate, and as I said, it's Java, so just uh, specify this jar file, and it accepts both uh, URLs and local files. So that, that's great. Uh, there is no reason not to do that in every single build. It may take a few minutes, depending on how many pages you have, but it's going to be useful. Um, again, this is not very clean. I would like to have that in a better format, like uh, there's a lot of redundancy here. I wonder if we could expand that in some way, have that in a variable somewhere, but I'm sure you can think of other, other ways to do that. Okay, uh, almost there. Um, documentation, who uses JS doc? One, two, okay, not many people. So I, I, I use JSDoc and I recently discovered this other package. If you are developing open source on GitHub, the standard is becoming, uh, or uh, very often you will find documentation in a markdown format. I personally prefer it when, for those things at least. Um, so very quickly, um, this package allows you to have a template. This is going to be expanded with your documentation. Um, so you run the command like that, you specify the source files, and this, um, um, this uh, substitution here is just to get rid of a, uh, an ugly um, header that it dumps, I don't know why. So I just remove it that way, and that will be your readme.md, if you want, okay? So typically you will have all your uh, nice icons, how to install, hello, this is a public project, credits, whatever. Everything will be here, and you will just have that single line here as a placeholder, and when you run that uh, command, it will populate your whole documentation there with all your classes and methods and variables and everything. So again, I think it's a better way of doing it. And again, because it's integrated with your whole uh, development cycle is going to be there always and always updated, so ideal. And we are getting to the end, so, well, I recommend Mocha, you have many other libraries for testing. Uh, logging is one of those neglected aspects. We do it doing console log, and, but when you have a complex project, it's going to be a mess very quickly. Every package is going to dump those logs in a different format different file names, uh, how are they going to be recycled and removed. So better to have one package for logging and use, for example, Winston or whatever you prefer and have it encapsulated in that way. Um, just uh, uh, an example of how you could generate your assets, your front-end assets uh, as part of your build cycle. Uh, in this case, I'm compiling SAS source files to, to generate the CSS that I need. This is a uh, BS, is not bullshit, but uh, bootstrap. Uh, and again, that could be part of your build. And finally, when you have the, the whole thing working, I recommend, remember we said we want to keep those processes independent and manage them as separate entities. Uh, I recommend PM2. Who is familiar with PM2? 
I'm curious. Okay, a few people again, not so many. Uh, it's really good, really simple. It allows you to launch instances, uh, stop them, uh, dump the configuration in, on a file to launch it on a separate server. So very handy. And this is the last one. I'm finishing. Uh, thank you. Just in time. Uh, quick uh, resources. So coming from W3C, I already mentioned our validators. Uh, use them, contribute to them. They are public on GitHub. We, ha we have so much open source on GitHub. So if you are ever bored, please go there. We have literally uh, hundreds of repositories. And many of those are software. There are lots of specs, but there is also open source software. Um, the first page is a small summary of Node.js good practices that we compiled internally. Uh, it's not complete by any means, but it's a, a good starting point. Uh, the second page is a wiki page, public wiki page, where we list uh, resources. It's like a meta list of resources about JavaScript and Node.js. Um, then, as I said, our public repositories. And uh, on that page, W3C developers, you have pointers to all those projects you can contribute to validators, checkers, uh, things we liberate to the community, and so on. And uh, if you ever want to share code, especially Node.js code or JavaScript in general, there are a few solutions there. I recommend these two, Code Sandbox and Rankit. You also have uh, CodePen, but CodePen is all only front-end, while those two tools allows you to, to run server-side uh, Node.js. So that's very useful. And I see we have four minutes. Great. So, uh, comments, questions. I, I'm really interested in hearing from those of you who have come up with different solutions to the same problems. Or questions. Puede ser en español, por supuesto. Have you run into any problem? Using file as a dependency in the Sorry, say that again. When you use file as a dependency ah, yeah. in the package JSON, uh, NPM creates a scene link in the node modules of the other folder. But it doesn't behave like NPM. When you install a package in NPM, if the dependency is, if you don't have conflicts of versions, it moves the dependency to the root level. So it's available to the folks uh, right. So it's, it's not exactly the same uh, run uh, install dependency as an NPM file, as a, as a file link, as uh, a dependency from, from the repository. And you can, what we use is uh, we make an NPM package and we refer the package uh, from the repository. Have you run into any problem? Have you deployed the, the, any the modules on the on production? Uh, not by doing this, no. Uh, I wasn't aware it was a sim link. I, that kind of sounds familiar, but I didn't realize. But in practice, I didn't see the, the issues. But that's a good point. It might be cleaner to just package it and locally. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I said initially that I would. I didn't have the time because I cannot share some of these projects that we used. Um, most of that is open source, but again, there are a few other projects here that I used as experiments. So yeah, I want to do that. Uh, again, my handle is Tripu, so in a few days, if you go to GitHub, I hope to have it there as a skeleton. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.